Excellencies, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm testing the microphone. Yes, it functions. You are all welcome to this seminar organized by the Finnish Institute of International Affairs and dealing with a, a very important topic, the future of nuclear arms control. I'm very happy to to open the, uh, the seminar and uh, present a very distinguished uh, panel uh, of ours to you this morning. But before I do that, let me just uh, say a couple of words uh, of introduction to the topic. Uh, it used to be so that in the, in the old, I'm not going to say old good days, but in the old days of the Cold War era, this field, uh, the field of arms control used to be one of the key fields of cooperation between the, uh, the great powers, between the US and the Soviet Union. But what has happened after the Cold War is that we have seen a, a gradual collapse of the entire regime. It has become a playing field for great power competition and also confrontation. There has been little willingness, in my view, uh, to adjust to the key, to adjust the key agreements to the new political environment. We are living in a new environment with a new set up of actors and new strategic conditions. Lack of mutual trust between Russia and the U.S. has led to serious consequences, and not only that, we have some very powerful new actors. Uh, that are uh, not that willing to take part in, in discussions on, on arms control. And I'm, of course, referring to China, which is a, a topical actor. Also, this discussion or this, with this theme we are discussing this morning. Because our, our focus uh, with this topic, nuclear arms control at the crossroads, what are, are the stakes for international security, will, uh, will be in particular the INF, Treaty, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, uh, which is now, as, as we know, at the risk of ceasing to exist in August this year. What would be the consequences, of, uh, consequences for the great power relations if that would happen? What, how would that affect the security political situation in Europe and here in Europe's north, in the Baltic Sea region? Uh, these are all questions that we will address this morning. I want to point out that this seminar forms a part of, of a, a research project that we are uh, conducting at the Finnish Institute of uh, International Affairs uh, entitled New Challenges for Strategic De Deterrence. And that project uh, is funded by the government's plan for analysis, assessment, and re research. Uh, we are thankful for this, this uh, funding provided to us. And this, this uh, project is led by uh, our senior research fellow, uh, Leo Michel, who is also going to chair this event. Uh, many thanks to Leo for a long-term commitment to our institute and also for the leadership uh, and expertise in this uh, important research project. We are having, as you see, a lot of uh, expertise in the panel. Uh, uh, the speakers will make their presentations one by one and, and Leo will chair and then after the presentations we will have a, a possibility to, to ask questions, make comments to the speakers. Our first speaker will be Mr. Frank Rose, a senior fellow from, from the Brookings Institution in the US. Uh, Frank Rose has served uh, in many uh, positions related to the topic that we will be discussing this morning. In 2000, from 2014 to 17, he was the Assistant Secretary of State for Arms Control Verification and Compliance at the US State Department. Uh, he has also previously had numerous positions at the office of the Secretary of Defense in the States. We very much look forward to your presentation, Mr. Mr. Rose, and this is not the first time you are, we are hosting you in, in, in our event, so many thanks. Thanks for, for, for being a regular visit, visitor to our, our, our seminars. 
The second uh, speaker will, is, is equally uh, uh, an eminent expert of the theme, Sir Adam Thompson, currently the director of, of European Leadership Network since 2016, but previously 38 years of experience from the British Foreign Service in various positions and very much looking forward to, to your views on the topic as well. Uh, our commentator comes from, from Finland, uh, today, in today's condition, <laughs> conditions from Sweden, where she works at, at CIPRI, uh, the, the Swedish Institute in, in the field, Associate Fellow Tarja Kronberg is there. We Finns know, know her from, from her political career also, uh, having been a party leader for the Green Party, member of the European Parliament, member of this parliament, Yes, and also a director of, of a research institute in Denmark uh, many years ago. Your, Tarja is a, 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 an expert of, of this field as well. So uh, now I, I uh, give the floor to, to Frank Rose. And then uh, before doing that, uh, about uh, our chair, Mr. Leo Michel, uh, apart from being a, a, a visiting senior fellow at FIA, and the director of this research project uh, to which the, the, the seminar uh, links to. He has been a former director for NATO policy and non-nuclear arms control in the office of the US Secretary of Defense, and also many positions in the defense administration of the, of the US earlier. So really, a lot of experience and, and expertise. Mr. Rose, the floor is yours. Hmm? Thank you so much for the very, very kind uh, invitation. It is a real pleasure to be back in Helsinki. This is the first time I've been to Helsinki when it has not been January. I definitely prefer March to January. And, and let me also thank the Finnish Institute for International Affairs. I think this is the third event that you have hosted on my behalf. Um, the title of my talk this morning is End of an Era, the INF Treaty, New Start in the Future of Strategic Stability. And in my presentation this morning, I'd like to do the following things. First, I want to place the current state of nuclear arms control and strategic stability uh, in a broader geopolitical context. Uh, second, I'll discuss the reasons for and implications of the end of the Intermediate Nuclear Forces or INF Treaty. <clears throat> Third, I'll discuss the prospects for extending the new Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty or New START Treaty. And finally, and this will be the fun part, I'll make some recommendations as to what I believe a new framework for strategic stability might look like. The thrust of my argument is as follows. The demise of the INF Treaty and the overall US-Russia strategic stability regime is a result of fundamental shifts in the geopolitical environment in the evolution of technology. In order to be effective, any new nuclear arms control or strategic stability framework will need to incorporate new actors like China and emerging technologies like outer space, cyber, and artificial intelligence. We should begin this discussion by acknowledging that the current geopolitical environment is fundamentally different than the one we encountered in the 1990s and 2000s. During that period, one of the key objectives of US and European foreign policy was integrating Russia and China into the Western-led international order. However, as my colleagues, colleague at the Brookings Institution, Thomas Wright, notes in his recent book, All Measures Short of War, The Contest for the 21st Century in the Future of American Power, quote, the United States 
is in competition with Russia and China for the future of the international order, end quote. Therefore, the U.S. relationship with those two countries is no longer about integration or convergence, but about finding a way to effectively manage competition in a way that reduces the risk of conflict, especially with regards to nuclear weapons. With regards to arms control, I've increasingly come to the view that the progress made on nuclear arms control and arms reductions, especially in the late 80s and early 1990s, was a result of the unique political circumstances at the time, primarily the collapse of the Soviet Union and Russia's subsequent financial difficulties. That said, I would argue the vast majority of the U.S. strategic community, Democrats and Republicans, believe Russia shared our view on the need to reduce the role and numbers of nuclear weapons in our defense strategy. Looking back, I don't believe that was the case. For example, and I've said this on numerous occasions, Russia did not sign the New START Treaty in 2010 because it believed in, quote, a world without nuclear weapons. They don't. For Russia, New START was primarily about maintaining strategic nuclear parity with the United States, capping the number of operationally deployed U.S. strategic nuclear warheads in delivery systems, and providing insights into U.S. nuclear forces that they wouldn't get without the treaty. As one of my Russian colleagues once told me, quote, I fear a world without nuclear weapons. And all you have to do is look at Russia's long-term strategic situation to understand why. For example, Russia has no real allies. Uh, I guess they have Lukashenko and Belarus, but that's not going too well these days in Assad and Syria. But other than that, they don't have any real allies, whereas the United States has friends, allies, and partners around the world. Russia also does not have a modern 21st century economy. Uh, think to yourself, besides oil and gas, what does Russia export on the civilian market? I can't think of many things. Uh, third, while its conventional forces have certainly improved since the late 1990s, it's not on par with that of the United States. Um, fourth, it no longer has the strategic weight of numbers. If you look back in Russian history, one of its uh, greatest strategic assets were numbers. But if you look at their population over the past 25 years, it continues to shrink every year. And finally, Russia faces a long-term challenge from China. Now, I understand Russia and China currently have a, quote, strategic partnership, but let's be honest about what that strategic partnership is focused on. It's about balancing American power. And if you look below the surface, there tends to be a lot of distrust amongst the Russian and Chinese national security uh, uh, establishments. So given this overarching security environment, what does Russia have to ensure its security over the long term? I would argue nuclear weapons. And to understand the demise of the INF Treaty, you need to understand this strategic context. Now, let's talk about INF. I like to say INF stands for it's never finished. Uh, as someone who had to manage this issue in government. Uh, Russia has had concerns about the INF Treaty for a very long time. Indeed, the Soviet military had serious concerns about the treaty in the 80s, but those concerns were overruled by General Secretary Gorbachev because he believed he needed to reduce tensions with the United States to allow for the restructuring of the Soviet economy. Furthermore, and this is uh, something that many people don't know, in 2004 and 2005, Russia proposed that the United States and Russia, quote, jointly withdraw from the INF Treaty, arguing 
that the treaty no longer reflected the current security situation in Eurasia. I was a junior officer at the Pentagon at the time when Sergei Ivanov, the then defense minister, made the proposal to Donald Rumsfeld, who at the time was uh, Secretary of Defense in the United States. In particular, Ivanov noted that the proliferation of medium and intermediate range uh, missiles by states like China, North Korea, India, Pakistan, and Iran made the INF Treaty in Eurasia irrelevant. Now, while the Bush administration declined to take Russia up on its offer to jointly withdraw from the treaty, it was probably around this time that Russia decided to embark on a covert development of a treaty prohibited cruise missile. And in July 2014, the U.S. Department of State uh, declared, well, the U.S. government through the U.S. Department of State in the Obama administration declared that, quote, Rush, the Russian Federation is in violation of its obligations under the INF Treaty not to possess, produce, or flight test a ground launch cruise missile with a range capability of 500 kilometers to 5,500 kilometers or possess or produce launchers of such missile. Now, I think it's important to note that prior to this public declaration in July 2014, there was almost a year of quiet diplomacy with the Russians in an attempt to bring Russia back into compliance. Um, none of these diplomatic efforts which were carried out in both the Obama and the Trump administration over six years uh, made any progress in resolving the issue. Uh, therefore, I believe the Trump administration's decision to exit the treaty is certainly understandable. From my perspective, the key question was not whether we could have saved the INF treaty, a highly doubtful proposition but whether the Trump administration handled the diplomacy surrounding the exit from the treaty effectively. And, you know, I still talk to members of this administration, and what I told them was as follows. If you felt it was necessary to get out of the treaty, you needed to do it in the following way. First, you needed to make sure that responsibility for killing the INF Treaty fell squarely on Russia. And secondly, you needed to keep U.S. allies united. Unfortunately, the administration's initial announcement of the decision failed on both counts. President Trump's announcement on the sidelines of a campaign rally without any prior consultations with U.S. allies represented, in my view, clear diplomatic malpractice. By making the initial announcement the, in a manner that they did, the Trump made, administration made the issue about the United States instead of Russia's violation where blame for the demise of the INF Treaty squarely belonged. Now, that said, the Trump administration seems to have recognized its mistake in failing to consult adequately with allies in late 2018 and has thus worked to ensure alliance unity in advance of Secretary Pompeo's announcement last month that the United States would exit the treaty. Indeed, in a February 1st statement, NATO allies noted their full support of the United States' decision to provide a six-month written notice to treaty parties of its intention to withdraw from the treaty. As I noted earlier, we need to acknowledge that the INF Treaty's demise is a direct result of the declining fortunes of the U.S.-Russia strategic stability regime and the inability of that regime to respond effectively to the evolving security environment. For example, I believe that Russia and other critics of the treaty have val a valid point when they argue that while the INF Treaty constrains the United States and Russia 
It does nothing to limit China's missile capability. When the INF Treaty was signed in 1987, there were only two countries with significant medium and intermediate range ballistic missiles. That has changed. China now has the largest fo a force of ballistic missiles of INF range in the world. And even if we were able to bring the Russia back into compliance with the treaty, you still have this fundamental challenge that China is outside the major, a major strategic arms control event uh, structure. And quite frankly, I think it's going to be hard for arms control to have a future, at least from a U.S. perspective, as long as China, one of the United States' if not the biggest strategic competitor, is outside of that framework. But it's going to take time to develop a new framework and it's going to take time to engage China to convince them to come in the, to that framework. And that's why I think it's very important that we should extend the New START Treaty. Now, from my perspective, I believe there are several good reasons to extend New START. First, it will help maintain stable deterrence between the United States and Russia in the near to mid term. Um, as General John Hyten, the commander of U.S. Strategic Command, the military command responsible for U.S. nuclear forces, testified recently to Congress, quote, I've stated for the record in the past, and I'll state again, that I'm a big supporter of the treaty. When it comes to nuclear weapons and nuclear capabilities, that bilateral verifiable arms control agreements are essential to our ability to provide an effective deterrent." End quote. Second, the transparency mechanisms, notifications, and dialogue by the treaty can help prevent miscalculation especially at a time where we have few political channels open to, with the Russians. Third, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, extension will provide valuable time to facilitate a transition to a new framework for strategic stability. Fourth, it will help maintain domestic political support within the United States to allow us to modernize our strategic forces. Indeed, ratification of the New START Treaty in 2010 played an important role in bringing reluctant congressional Democrats on board in favor of the nuclear modernization program. That support, however, is beginning to fray. As Senator Robert Menendez, the lead Democrat on the Senate Foreign Relations, recently noted, quote, I want to remind the administration that bipartisan support for nuclear modernization is tied to maintaining an arms control process that controls and seeks to reduce Russian nuclear forces, end quote. The Trump administration is currently conducting a review to determine whether it will seek to extend New START. At the same time, the Trump, administ uh, Trump administration officials, including National Security Advisor John Bolton, have also mentioned the idea of negotiating a, quote, new treaty to replace New START. They argue that New START does not effectively address Russia's non-strategic nuclear forces or new types of systems like hypersonic glide vehicles and intercontinental nuclear-armed, nuclear-powered, undersea autonomous torpedoes. If you, that's a long one. Uh, this is a fair point. But negotiating a new agreement in the remaining two years of the Trump administration's current term in office is probably not viable for several reasons. First, if a new negotiation were to begin, Russia would almost certainly insist on including items that are currently unacceptable to the United States, such as limitations on missile defense, 
and Sir Adam would like this, British and French nuclear forces, outer space, conventional strike systems, and a whole host of other issues. Second, with the U.S.-Russia political relationship at its worst point since the end of the Cold War, it is difficult to see how larger political issues would not intrude on any arms control negotiation. And finally, there are also serious doubts whether the Trump administration has the right team in place, especially at the State Department, to negotiate a successor agreement to New START. Furthermore, New START contains mechanisms to allow parties to address these new types of systems that uh, Ambassador Bolton, Bolton has raised. Thus, I would argue the United States can simultaneously extend New START while at the same time uh, addressing concerns about new types of Russian systems like the hypersonic glide vehicle. From my perspective, the easiest thing to do at this point would be to exercise a simple five-year extension of the New START Treaty as is allowed by the treaty. However, I think it is very unclear whether the Trump administration will do that. Let me now briefly address the issue of new and emerging technologies. As previously noted, emerging technologies like cyber and outer space are increasingly impacting strategic stability calculations, especially with regards to nuclear command, control, and communications. U.S. Director of National Intelligence Daniel Coates highlighted the growing cyber and anti-satellite threat to U.S. and allied critical infrastructure in a recent uh, testimony before the Senate Select Intelligence Committee last month. Uh, with regards to cyber, he said, and I quote, our adversaries and strategic competitors will increasingly use cyber capabilities, including cyber espionage, cyber attack, and influence to seek political, economic, and military advantage over the United States and its allies and partners. And with regards to anti-satellite weapons, he noted that, quote, China and Russia are training and equipping their military space forces and fielding new anti-satellite weapons to hold U.S. and allied space services at risk even as they push international agreements on non-weaponization of space, end quote. I'm particularly concerned about how cyber and anti-satellite capabilities could be used to attack nuclear command, control, and communication systems, also known as NC3. Indeed, the 2018 U.S. Nuclear Posture Review discusses the potential cyber threat to NC3 systems and directs the U.S. Department of Defense to enhance its ability to defend against cyber threats. Additionally, other emerging technologies like artificial intelligence could also have a serious impact on strategic stability in the future. To date, these emerging technologies have not played a major role in strategic stability discussions amongst major powers. This needs to change. Strategic stability in the emerging security environment no longer follows the two-state, U.S. and Russia, one-weapon nuclear model of the Cold War. Today's security environment includes multiple states and emerging technologies like cyber, outer space, and artificial intelligence. Given these changes in the security environment, we need to develop a new strategic framework focused on managing great power competition and reducing the risk of nuclear use. On that note, let me conclude by making several specific recommendations on how we might achieve this. First, the United States and Russia should extend the New START Treaty. 
Extending New START will help maintain strategic stability in the near to midterm and provide valuable time as we make the transition to a new strategic framework that includes new actors and emerging technologies. Second, the United States and Russia should also convene bilateral strategic stability talks. The purpose of these talks should not be to negotiate a new arms reduction treaty, but to have an honest and frank discussion of each side's strategic concerns and identify practical measures aimed at reducing risk. Third, it is critical to find a way to integrate China into a future strategic stability framework. China has become the United States' most significant long-term competitor. If we cannot find a way to eventually integrate China into a future st stability framework, the prospects of establishing an effective framework will be dim. That said, I think there are a number of pragmatic near-term steps that could be taken between the U.S. and China to get this process started, such as establishing a bilateral missile launch notification regime similar to the bilateral missile launch notification regime that we have with Russia, connecting the U.S. Nuclear Risk Reduction Center with a Chinese entity, developing bilateral norms on outer space issues, and inviting Russia to participate in a new START inspection. Fourth, establish multilateral strategic dialogues that bring key nuclear players to the table to discuss stability issues. The chief purpose of these talks would be to discuss both issues of concern and to advance measures designed to reduce risk. Such talks could take various forms. We could do a U.S.-Russia trilateral format, a P5 format, and a P5 plus format to include India and Pakistan. And finally, we should develop norms of responsible for behavior for emerging domains such as cyber and outer space. And this needs to include a discussion of the impact of these emerging technologies uh, like cyber and space on nuclear command, control, and communication. So on that point, let me stop there and turn the floor over to Sir Adam. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Frank, uh, and uh, my deep thanks to FIIA uh, and to you, Leo, uh, for the privilege uh, and the opportunity of being able to speak here. Uh, I feel very honored. Thank you. Uh, the uh, discussion has been set up as one starting with INF, uh, and I want to say a little bit about that. Uh, but I wanted to go wider than that to consider uh, not just the INF crossroads at which uh, the world finds itself, uh, but uh, also uh, many of the other nuclear arms control crossroads. And third, uh, I wanted to sketch some possible general responses uh, to my analysis. Frank has actually covered a lot of the uh, ground, uh, and so I hope you'll forgive me if I adapt my comments a little bit to be a response and a commentary to his remarks. First, uh, a word or two on INF. Uh, from a European perspective, you have to ask the question whether the Americans are right that Russia is in violation. Uh, as a former NATO ambassador, uh, I uh, was involved in these debates uh, up until November 2016, 
uh, and I simply have to conclude uh, since the US has successfully lined up its uh, 27 now 28 other allies uh, that uh, it probably does have something convincing. Uh, but my second observation about uh, the process is that uh, the way this is playing out uh, is really quite Cold War. It feels uh, a rather zero-sum presentation. Frank said uh, that the task was for the US to position itself so that uh, Russia took all the blame. Uh, and finally, uh, last observation on, uh, uh, if you like, the NATO dimensions of this, both the Europeans and the Americans have handled this really quite badly. The United States uh, setting off uh, without bringing allies along, uh, although, as Frank says, that has been partially rectified. Europeans being slow to accept the American evidence. What are the likely consequences? Uh, there's impact, I think, on the transatlantic security relationship. Uh, US handling uh, augurs badly for the way this INF debate plays out, at least in a short term. Uh, I don't expect American pressure for uh, a Pershing dual track uh, type decision. It would be stupid to make INF a litmus test when there are sea-based and air-based alternatives. Uh, but if uh, NATO uh, and the US uh, pursue a very zero-sum approach to all of this, there will certainly be stresses in the US-Europe relationship, potentially quite serious ones. Uh, and on the Russian side, uh, it's reasonable to expect uh, Russia uh, to feed these US-Europe uh, stresses uh, intentionally <coughs> or otherwise. Russia is going to feel aggrieved, it will feel defensive, uh, it will remain paranoid about NATO and ballistic missile defense, uh, and it is perfectly aware of the d uh, potential divisiveness of the issue for NATO. Uh, it will behave badly to justify uh, its innocence. Uh, its best form of defense, as usual, will be attack. So expect uh, nuclear ambiguity around Kaliningrad. Uh, expect more uh, nuclear in the Baltic. Uh, expect enhanced pressure over NATO ballistic missile defense. Uh, I'm no expert on the Nordic-Baltic uh, dimensions of this, uh, but I can't see anything good uh, coming out of uh, INF trouble. Uh, that, however, is not uh, what I really want to focus on. Um, I don't think that INF demise is the most important thing happening in nuclear arms control. Uh, it's not even, unless we make it so, the central NATO-Russia trial of strength. Uh, that is really the question of enlargement. Uh, if you argue that Russian cheating on arms control is uh, a central point of contestation between NATO and Russia, then I would just observe that both sides have been alleging cheating by the other since long before 2013 when INF was first called into question. Nor, I think, uh, if we somehow fixed INF, uh, would that by itself make the outlook for nuclear arms control a great deal better. Uh, as Frank has half said in making a very cogent argument for the extension of New START, it may not happen. Uh, in fact, as an outside observer, I would say New START was in deep trouble for reasons that have nothing to do with INF, but which INF make worse. Uh, and indeed, I would go further. 
uh, if New Start is not extended, I think uh, it's very plausible to imagine that after February 2021, there may be no strategic arms control between the world's two largest nuclear powers. This uh, would be an unfamiliar world and therefore a very uncomfortable one. But I think we have to ask now against the possibility uh, that we lose not just INF but New START, how much does an absence of strategic nuclear arms control really matter? What indeed are the stakes for international security? How should we tackle nuclear arms control more generally? So what I'm suggesting uh, is a rather different conversation than the one uh, that has been set up uh, for this exchange. Uh, we've been invited to look at INF, uh, look at the impacts on New START or on the NPT review conference. Uh, in other words, the uh, immediate prospects. Uh, I would like to use the rest of my comments to reflect on the picture as viewed from the other end of the telescope. Suppose there is no strategic nuclear arms control. How much does it matter? Where do we go? The outlook has been rarely so unpromising. Uh, Frank has given us a very uh, realistic uh, analysis of the implications of uh, great power competition uh, and how that uh, impacts. Uh, I think uh, this competition is likely to be enduring, so it's part of the backdrop for any consideration of the future of nuclear arms control. Uh, more than that, uh, we are in a world uh, where arms control itself is very unpromising. Uh, the world is in a state that is neither good enough for arms control, as it was in the 1990s, nor bad enough, as it was after the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, and my hunch, I think exactly like yours, Frank, is that actually the prospects for 20th century style arms control are very poor. Underlying that, uh, I think a really profoundly difficult problem uh, is the complacency uh, in the international public and politics about nuclear risks. That's completely different from the 20th century Cold War. Uh, and it has made it easy to live in a state of affairs where the dialogue between the United States and Russia on nuclear matters, uh, or between NATO and Russia, or between the P5 and the world is very limited. We are very complacent about managing nuclear risk. Don't mistake me. Uh, as I take this approach, please understand that I would far, far rather that INF was not violated, that Russia returned to compliance and INF continued. I would far, far rather that New START was extended. But I do think we have to contemplate the possibility uh, that in a very short amount of time, uh, basically two years, uh, we uh, have no nuclear arms control to speak of. So how much of a problem uh, does an absence of INF or New START uh, present us with? Uh, I'd observe that already we don't have all that much nuclear arms control. Uh, we do have welcome constraints of international humanitarian law, partial test ban treaty and comprehensive test ban treaty. Uh, 
but uh, large parts of what is now nuclear uh, are, no, uh, are not within the, the compass, the framework uh, uh, of any arms control. Frank has made this point, uh, but let me just run very quickly through how much the world has changed since SALT or since 1987, uh, INF. Uh, first of all, the US-Russia relationship. INF is anachronistic because there are now sea and air-based alternatives within the 500 to 5,000 kilometer range. Uh, New START doesn't cap tactical nuclear weapons, of which Russia still holds a great many. Uh, even in good times, the best times for traditional arms control, Washington and Moscow could not get below about 6,400 nuclear weapons, strategic nuclear weapons each. Look at other nuclear powers. Again, Frank has made the point. Uh, an element in the U.S. INF withdrawal is going to be Chinese intermediate uh, range missiles. And it's not just China that has these weapons. Uh, it's not just China that is nuclear. Uh, India and Pakistan, uh, potentially North Korea, potentially uh, Iran. Uh, there are real issues around the problems of uh, verification <coughs> to traditional nuclear deals. Uh, all nuclear powers deploy dual-use delivery systems that are capable of misinterpretation by the other side. Judging whether a cruise missile is conventionally or nuclear tipped is not so straightforward. Uh, and then, uh, and perhaps above all, uh, new technologies, uh, the, their impacts on nuclear stability are completely uncontrolled in the sense of being unregulated, and they are evolving at extraordinary speed. Uh, the Nuclear Threat Initiative's report at the end of last year argued that probably no contemporary nuclear command and control was invulnerable to cyber attack, or at least could not safely be assumed to be so. Uh, it's not just uh, cruise missiles that are ambiguous. Uh, the same is true for hypersonic missiles, for example. The same is true for drones. Uh, it, the same is true for Russia's Poseidon underwater drone, responding to fears about US ballistic missile defense. Entanglement uh, of uh, nuclear and conventional, blurring the line between the two, is a particularly troubling aspect of uh, new technology's impact on nuclear stability. Increasingly, nuclear command and control systems are being used to support non-nuclear military operations. Uh, Frank has laid this out. I won't uh, 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 belabor uh, the point, but the 2018 U.S. Nuclear Posture Review threatens to consider using nuclear weapons against any state that attacks its nuclear command and control, whether or not that state has itself used nuclear weapons. Uh, and yet, in a conflict, in a conventional phase, Russia might want to take out uh, U.S. satellites because they com control conventional and not just nuclear. And finally, uh, I just observe uh, the complexity of all of this. Uh, to add to the problems of the pace of developments in which deployments and technology are, outstrip uh, are outstripping arms control, uh, we have to consider the practical problems. New START looks simple compared to what Frank seems to be pointing towards which is a hypothetical, multilateral nuclear arms control framework, potentially a treaty, that factors in not just all the new technologies, but the interplay between those new technologies and nuclear. How does artificial intelligence enhanced cyber attack play on nuclear defense? Deterrence, excuse me. As a matter of practical diplomacy, Frank, uh, how does one negotiate such 
a treaty or a framework. I find it easy to believe that the Iran nuclear deal was the last multilateral nuclear agreement we shall see for a long time. Uh, and even it was not a treaty. And even it was something that the United States has felt it could violate. So for me, uh, the absence of wider nuclear arms control is what really matters. Uh, and I do think that the states are absolutely enormous. In a remaining five, ten minutes, let me have my own shot at uh, trying to suggest what to do. Uh, as I do so, uh, please let me say, and please uh, will you hear me say, that I agree with virtually everything that Frank Rose has suggested as practical ways forward. Uh, I would like to be a little less practical, in a sense. Um, all these problems uh, of technology, of pace and complexity, were well described at the Carnegie Endowment's annual nuclear conference in Washington earlier this month. We're asking ourselves here today, what's at stake? Well, at that conference, ELN member Igor Ivanov, former Russian foreign minister, pretty experienced, was quoted as saying, and I quote, uh, we are moving in a minefield and we don't know from where the explosion will come. If you consider how close the world has come by miscalculation or accident to nuclear detonation in the nearly 75 years since 1945, it seems to me, just as an objective matter, that the likelihood of the world getting through the infinitely more complex next 75 years without a nuclear detonation is vanishingly small. Indeed, the current complacency of publics and their governments, uh, given that, I find it analytically persuasive that only a horrific nuclear detonation will cause enough international shock to change the arms control dynamics significantly. And on those dark days, I just hope that the explosion is on the Korean peninsula where there aren't so many weapons, rather than in Europe, uh, which is responsible for about 95% of all nuclear weapons in the world. But I still know that the radiation from Korea will poison me and my loved ones. That's a council of despair. This problem is open to rational assessment and solution, and international security is at stake. It's high time to get started. I tentatively, therefore, offer you a few thoughts to add to the great many that real experts are developing. As a diplomatic practitioner, uh, I'm focused less on exactly what. Frank has given us some of the what. Uh, more on the how. Uh, as I do so, I do not want you to think that I am a uh, starry-eyed idealist. Uh, I have worked on nuclear issues for the British government for many years. Uh, I have written some of the most persuasive arguments inside the British government for the British nuclear deterrent. But I do think that we need to not just think about how to extend New Start, Frank, but how to think about dealing with the nuclear problem much more broadly. In other words, to look from the other end of the telescope. So I think we have to uh, sustain a debate, in fact, uh, encourage it, uh, not just on risk reduction, not just on arms control, 